This presentation is brought to you by Arizona State University's Julianne Wrigley Global Institute of Sustainability and a generous investment by Julianne Wrigley. and delve what's behind it and what it leads to and things like that. Um, and I'm not going to steal this thunder by telling you exactly what it is, though most of you have read this article, so I think you know, but there's more uh, behind him uh, than that article alone, and he has a new book uh, about sustainability by design. Sustainable by design. Yes. And, and, and thinking about design as an important principle, and I was just suggesting to him before this lecture that, of course, design in terms of buildings and objects and all is very important, but many of us are also concerned about design of environments and, and the world, in fact, being a product of, to a certain extent, human as well as natural design. It's not strictly a product of natural design. And that we increasingly have to take responsibility for what we're doing to the world and maybe begin to think of it, uh, uh, including design principles. Uh, the other thing I should announce, and you all will know it from having re read the um, announcement, um, Stuart comes to us from England, not Canada. I think when we invited him, he came to us from Canada, uh, where he's uh, been both a professor and an administrator there um, in design, but has recently moved to, to Lancaster in the UK, uh, where he's running this new um, organization that I assume we're going to hear a little bit about. Mm -hmm. Uh, about imagination, and I think it's um, a great topic, uh, and bringing together all the things that we <coughs> were interested of in to hear from you with these new ideas and places you're going and things you're doing uh, makes me very excited. So please. Thank you very much. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, I'm very pleased to be, to be here to, to talk. Uh, about, uh, about this topic today. Um, I understand that many of you have already read this, this article or paper, and uh, I hope I'll be able to add uh, something uh, by illustrating it, and, uh, and maybe through the discussion afterwards, I've also uh, updated some of the, uh, the, the thoughts and, and brought them up to date. Um, as you just heard, I, I've recently relocated after 17 years in Canada uh, back to the UK and uh, uh, I, I was uh, offered the opportunity uh, at Lancaster University uh, to uh, co-direct a new initiative called Imagination at Lancaster, uh, which is a new, um, we're calling it a creative research lab uh, where design is central, uh, but the, the vision is to develop uh, graduate programs and research in interdisciplinary design uh, because not, and it's not just focused on sustainability but sus certainly sustainability is a very large component of it and when we, when we start thinking about sustainability then we, we have to very often think outside of traditional disciplines and traditional ways of doing things and so when I was uh, offered this opportunity to uh, develop this new initiative uh, I jumped at the chance uh, it's, uh, it's a very exciting new opportunity. Uh, 
in a in a relatively small research intensive university. Um, there's uh, 10,000 students on campus, so in these days that's a relatively small university. When I went to university, I was at the largest uh, single campus university in the UK, which was 11,000 students at that time. Uh, so you can see that things have uh, progressed a lot in over the last few years. But uh, it's a small research university with a, with a top research uh, um, reputation in the UK. Uh, but in the in the UK system, design and design thinking have not been uh, areas which have traditionally been built into the traditional university model. They came out they came up through a different model, uh, through art schools, then art and design schools, then polytechnics. And only rec relatively recently, design has found itself in a in a university system where uh, the polytechnics some of the polytechnics were converted into universities. So it doesn't tend to have. The, uh, the history of design research, which it, which it does in North America. And so I hope to bring some of the experience that I had in a graduate faculty in Canada to this new initiative uh, in Lancaster. So in this talk, uh, what I'm going to look at is, is sustainability from a uh, somewhat historical perspective to give an overview of some of the most significant developments uh, that, that eventually led us to this term, sustainability, uh, where that's come from and, and why that has emerged, and, and really trying to understand what it represents in contemporary society. Um, and I'm going to suggest a way of understanding the ideas within this broader context of, of human endeavor. And I've called it sustainability, the evolution of a contemporary myth, and, and I hope uh, when I get to the, the end of the talk and uh, perhaps through some of the discussion which follows, uh, you'll understand what I mean by that term, a contemporary myth. Um, now, as most of you will be familiar, the, 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 the publication of Our Common Future in 1987 uh, from the World Commission of, on Environment and Development, which we come to know as the Brundtland Report, uh, it was this report which really popularized the term uh, sustainable development, which it defined, which uh, this is now a very well-known understanding of what sustainable development is, uh, development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Now, that's a, a, a much-quoted definition. Um, it's very brief and it's very vague. Uh, and from it, there have arisen literally hundreds, if not thousands, of principles of sustainable development, which, which are tailored to all sorts of interests, um, industries, and views. And uh, the term sustainability and sustainable development, particularly over just the last few years, is used and overused and being used to, to mean, mean virtually anything. Um, but in general terms, I think it, it can be understood as a type of development that takes into consideration uh, th these three interrelated areas. And, and they're interrelated, interdependent, and they, and they must be dealt with in a, s a simultaneous way. Not, you can't choose one of them and deal with just that bit. Environmental stewardship, social equity and justice, and, the, and economic issues. And it's the interaction between those things um, which makes sustainability and sustainable development very complex um, and very uncertain and very uncomfortable because uh, it really encompasses such a huge span of ideas uh, that, that where do you scope things because you can just keep going out and out and out to see the ramifications of human activity. And we're not used to doing that. We're not used to doing that in our industries. In our, in our professions, in our disciplines, or in our universities. Um, but in many ways, I think it can be argued, and I will argue here, that the statement of these uh, three principal concerns of sustainability is our current way, our contemporary way, uh, in a secularized society of repeating age-old wisdom teachings that have been expressed down the centuries um, in the form of mythology and through our sacred literature. We've always had and will always have myths 
because it's through this metaphorical language of myth that a culture is able to express its deepest concerns. And sustainability uh, can be seen as our modern myth, which has emerged from an age over the last few hundred years, an age of science, technology, and reason. And like uh, many previous myths that have uh, helped define our understandings of our place in the world, uh, it aspires to uh, an undefinable and, I would say, an unattainable goal, a goal which nevertheless many see as worth striving towards and, and aiming at, but which forever eludes actually arriving at it and getting there. In addition, it tells us that if, if we don't listen to this message uh, and if it goes unheeded we, and we fail to change our ways, then we will be the cause of our own destruction. So the message is both environmental, which we're all familiar with, and also ethical. It promotes more ethical behavior and improvement in the living conditions of those in need, especially in developing countries. So there's, there's social equity and social justice issues involved. And it encourages uh, conservation and preservation of the natural environment and, and asks us to pay attention to the effects and the impacts uh, and perhaps reduce our energy use, our consumption of resources, our finite resources very often, uh, our production of pollution and to perhaps moderate our tendencies towards uh, human greed. But sometimes, as in many of these kinds of discussions, it advo it, it, its, its advocates become rather hyperbolic. Uh, for example, uh, Gordon and Suzuki <coughs> have said in their book, the simple truth is that we are the last generation on earth that can save the planet. Now, that statement is an assumption and a warning, but it's certainly not a proven fact and it's anything but a simple truth. But how, so how do we interpret that? Well, it's, it's uh, perhaps overblown rhetoric, but it also can be seen as a well-intentioned message to try and spur us into action, to call attention to an issue, to a problem, uh, and perhaps spur us into changing our ways. And there are many, many other examples in the literature of sustainability and environmental writing who illustrate possibilities, practical measures for moderating our impacts on the planet, sort of how-to manuals, if you like, and others that warn against the imminent dangers to the future because of our destructive ways of living. Now, in that theme, in that general message, there's a sense of loss. The, the, a loss of a perfect state, a loss of innocence and a lot, loss of harmony uh, with nature and with community, with our fellow human beings. And there's also embedded in that story the idea that through right effort and right action we can somehow regain this lost state of perfection. And, and when you look at that in those broad general terms that this message is, is is conveying, uh, that, that's a repetitive theme throughout human history. As the poet uh, Borges has said, all our paradises are lost paradises, places of contentment that we've destroyed through our own folly and our own greed. And we see this in the history of myth. Um, a myth the term myth has a rather pejorative understanding in, in common uh, parlance these days, that myth is an untruth. Uh, but myth is actually uh, a different kind of way of speaking about the truth. And we see this, this, uh, these kinds of themes uh, throughout the history of mythology. So Pandora, uh, for example, in the, in the Greek myths, uh, curiosity uh, led her to open the box that released suffering and disease into an ideal world. Before that, it was perfect. Adam and Eve were expelled from the perfection of the Garden of, of Eden uh, through their human failings. Uh, and we point to our own uh, destruction of nature and are now striving to regain our uh, lost sense of an ideal through something we've called sustainability. <coughs> Now, the understanding that sustainability uh, 
may not actually be achievable in any practical sense does not make it any less important to consider. We've always created and will continue to create myths that allow us to understand our world and our place in it. The point of these stories uh, in the Greek myths, in the Bible, in the Bhagavad Gita, or any of the other wisdom traditions is not about achieving an end state as such. It's more about uh, asking us to take on the task of learning how to live in the world. It's the age-old question, how should we live? And sustainable development can be seen as our contemporary secularized version, because many of these are religious, uh, but our own contemporary secularized version of this same idea. Caring for the natural environment and ideas of socio-economic security and social justice and well-being are notions that have been with us for a very, very long time. But their importance and their mutual interdependence have only been reconfigured into an acceptable language for contemporary, developed, secularized societies in relatively recent years. But economics and merchandising and the business requirement for profit um, go back to time in immor immemorial. But in Christian cultures, profit and business have often been viewed in a somewhat, with a somewhat suspicious eye. And I mention uh, Christianity in particular because it was Christianity and the, the religion of Christianity that has most strongly influenced the development of Western industrialized countries. And it's the Western industrialized model which is now wreaking uh, such havoc on the environment through the, uh, the uh, industrialization combined with consumer capitalism. But there are numerous passages in the, in the New Testament that cast riches and wealth in a poor light. Now, whether we take these these uh, passages from the Bible literally or in terms of metaphor and symbolism, these stories have undoubtedly contributed to Western society's rather negative view of economic necessity. But ironically, it was the accumulation of vast wealth within the church with its associated exploitation and corruption and scandal that contributed to the reformation of the first half of the 16th century. Advances in science and technology and industry eventually led to the Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution of the 18th century. And as trade and, as, and commerce increased and expanded, the church that had once been unified by Rome became more fractured and more fragmented. So Protestantism, which rejected allegiance to Rome, grew through, amongst other things, the establishment in the 16th century of Lutherism in Germany, Calvinism in uh, Belgium and Holland and Low Countries, and Anglicanism in Britain. And since these initial phases of Protestantism, many other religions grew over, over the, 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 the subsequent years. So these developments in religious understandings and religious stories and myth, if you like, and, and interpretations of those stories uh, were attempts, or can at least be seen as attempts, to reform religious practices and uh, to reconcile them with, with this new scientific and industrial age, which occurred at the same time. Because these changes in, in religious understandings occurred during a time of rapid scientific discovery and innovation and understandings in that realm. The increased application of science in the development of technology and the expanding use of technology in creating commercial potential at, at, the, at the same time as all that was going on and part and parcel of it was massive urbanization which was a, a consequence of the factory system of industrialization and colonial expansion uh, and the British Empire primarily uh, uh, looking for markets uh, and, uh, and exploiting resources and so on. So this scientific uh, revolution and the age of reason are not only related to the fragmentation of the church, they're also related to a diminishment in its influence and power. And most Western societies from that time on have become increasingly secularized. And naturally with this secularization, the teachings of the church 
became less well known and less influential. So, jumping ahead now to the second half of the 20th century, after two or three centuries of scientific, industrial and commercial development and expansion, and with two world wars, the horrors of the Holocaust and the atomic bombings of Japan still in, relatively, uh, you know, in the relatively recent past, not only had the traditional myths and religions lost much of their relevance in Western industrialized societies, but also the worldview that, that had evolved since the Reformation, the so-called modern period, was now also beginning to be challenged. So during the second half of the 20th century, new understandings began to emerge and developed uh, into an era that we've now called the postmodern. Um, and yet before this, uh, there were many earlier indications that people were concerned with the environmental and socioeconomic consequences of the modern age and the age of industry um, and science. For example, um, a hundred years before, in the mid-1800s, Thoreau, Henry David Thoreau, the American philosopher, published Walden, which was highly critical of uh, the expanding technologies of that time. And the latter part of the, of the 19th century saw the establishment of the world's first national park and the formation of the Sierra Club, both in the United States, which was uh, expanding massively in terms of its industrial output at that point, and both aiming at conserving natural places and wildlife. Now, we can see that the reason that those, those things evolved, the First National Park and the Sierra Club, in response to the perceived threat to natural places and the natural environment because of this industrial expansion in the United States. So they were some early bubblings of environmental concerns and environmental action to preserve natural places because of industrialization. The other aspect of sustainability uh, that, I'm, that I'm going to emphasize is the social issues. I think the, the economic issues uh, are part and parcel of these other issues. Um, but So I'm not going to concentrate on that. But in terms of the social issues, which is another, this other important facet of sustainability, um, the late 19th century and the first half of the 20th century uh, witnessed a number of changes and, and developments. For example, the, fir the, it intro the introduction of the first Social Security and Health Insurance Acts, which looked at uh, issues such as you know, social justice and, uh, and so on, and some initial activity in, the, in changing the prevailing attitudes uh, towards the rights of women and of homosexuals. And some of these issues didn't actually uh, sort of kick in into, into demonstrable change in terms of in the environmental and social issues, uh, until later, until later in the 20th century. But the, the start uh, was much earlier, and eventually, in the late 20th century, as we shall see, uh, there was widespread reform. But the bubblings were much earlier. So coming back to the, the late 20th centuries, the, the 60s were a time of particularly significant unrest and fear and uncertainty, especially among the younger generation in the Western countries. The threat of nuclear war was, uh, triggered peace campaigns in Europe and the United States throughout the late 1950s, throughout the, the 60s and into the 70s. These uh, extensive protests challenged the wisdom of the establishment and the traditional conservative bastions of power because it was perceived by many that the very future of the planet was at stake and those fears were not entirely unfounded. In 1963, the world came to the brink of nuclear war with the Cuban Missile Crisis and this pervading threat to the future was evident through the books and the art of the time. Neville Schutz's novel On the Beach which was published in 1957, was a story of the, the world laid waste by atomic war. During the 60s, uh, protest songs were at their height from singers like uh, Bob Dylan and Joan Byers, and works by artists such as James Rosenkist and Larry Rivers contained 
uh, many references to death and destruction. This, this piece by uh, James Rosenquist called Campaign, you can see here there's a military uniform behind here with, with medals and these things in the background. They could be flowers or they could be explosions. And uh, this piece by uh, uh, Larry Rivers has got obvious uh, references to uh, uh, the missile crisis in Cuba. <clears throat> so these growing concerns about the actions of human beings and the, and the future uh, were spurred on by the publication in 1962 of Silent Spring by Rachel Carson. This book raised public awareness of the environmental costs and the impacts of widespread, in this case, widespread pesticide use. And, it, and the publication of this book is, is often linked to the, as being the start of the modern environmental movement. So that was what was happening in the 60s. Moving on now uh, to, the, to the, the 70s, the energy crisis which, which took place in the early 1970s when the OPEC countries placed an embargo on oil exports, raised awareness about energy use and led to developments in energy conservation and the consideration of alternative energy sources such as wind power. And as you, I will get to this uh, a bit later on, but it was at this time that we started to see these kinds of alternative energy movements um, and appropriate technology movements beginning to emerge during the early 70s. So this, uh, the raising of public consciousness that, to public consciousness that hy hydrocarbon-based energy sources were actually finite, uh, put at least a temporary end to the production of the, ga of the gas guzzler, especially in the United States, uh, which were then repl were replaced uh, by smaller, more modest automobiles. And at the beginning of that crisis, uh, the Japanese car manufacturers took over large proportions of the market in North America because the North American car makers were making very large cars uh, and uh, it was the Japanese uh, car manufacturers that were, that were producing small compacts uh, that were much more economical in terms of uh, fuel use and then eventually uh, the, uh, the North American manufacturers uh, uh, started to produce smaller compacts themselves. But uh, during this time, evidence of uh, increasing environmental destruction and concerns about energy resources resulted in the emergence and the expansion of the green movement uh, in, the, in the late 1960s and the early 1970s. So it was in that period, the late 60s and the early 70s, where the green movement uh, really began. So we saw over a very short period of time the development of a whole bunch of different movements and special interest groups to, uh, to address these kinds of issues. So the Club of Rome was formed in 1968. Uh, the US Environmental Protection Agency two years later in 1970. Friends of the Earth was formed in Europe and Greenpeace in Canada both established in 1971 and in 1972 the United Nations Conference in uh, Stockholm led eventually to the establishment of the United Nations Environmental Programme, or UNEP. So, alongside those developments that focused on the environment, there were also major changes in the social issues during these years and in our understandings of human rights, uh, areas that also became embraced by these notions of social justice and social equity, which now come under the sustainability umbrella. So during the 1960s, the civil rights movement uh, in the United States campaigning for the rights of black Americans where it, where it was at its peak in the early 60s. Martin Luther King delivered his I Have a Dream speech at a civil rights march in D.C. in 1963. And during the mid-60s, race riots broke out in major cities all over America. Uh, and in 1969, desegregation was introduced by the uh, U.S. Supreme Court. Another social change was women's emancipation, which was also uh, being developed in the 1960s. In 1960, the contraceptive pill was approved in the US, which started the sexual revolution and influenced the progress of the feminist movement. In 1970, Germaine Greer uh, published a highly influential book, The Female Eunuch, uh, which challenged the subservience of women in a male-dominated society. And in 1973, a woman's right to have an abortion was approved uh, in the United States. 
The beginning of the gay rights movement has been attributed to a riot that broke out at the Stonewall Inn in New York City in 1969 in response to a police raid. And the subsequent decade saw the establishment of, of many homosexual rights organizations. And so we see that during the late 50s, the 60s and the early 70s, a multitude of different and apparently disparate events and changes occurred throughout the Western world that in a very broad sense responded to firstly increased environmental awareness and recognition of the fragility of the planet and secondly to social inequities and our contemporary understandings of human rights. And then in 1972, a photograph of the Earth from space which was taken by the crew of Apollo 17 reinforced the finite nature of the Earth and its vulnerability. And this was a very profound photograph, uh, which really made people sit up and think how vulnerable this place is, how finite it is, and how beautiful it is. And so during the, these, these periods, from the late 1950s through the 60s into the early 70s, saw the, the essential foundations of sustainable development, although it wasn't called sustainable development in those years, it was, it was there that the foundations of it are rooted. In terms of my area, uh, which is uh, product design, the publication in 1971 of Papenek's Design for the Real World was highly influential in bringing the mood of these times to the, to the attention and within the scope of the product designer. Victor Papenek's lambasting, and I don't know if any of you have read this book, but it really is a lambasting of conventional product design and his call to address real needs rather than created wants resonated with many young designers at the time. Uh, his arguments were uh, rejected at the time by the, for example, the Industrial Design Society of America, uh, but today the same arguments are being put forward and they're fully embraced. So it, it takes some time for these things to uh, take hold. In 1973, another very, very influential book was published by uh, E.F. Schumacher called Small is Beautiful. Uh, and, and in this book, uh, he began to show the relationships between economic enterprise, poverty, especially poverty in developing countries, energy use, and environmental repercussions. Schumacher's views on the introduction of appropriate technology in developing countries to allow greater self-reliance paralleled many of the sentiments of Victor Papenek in the United States. Schumacher was based in England and began to be implemented through the establishment of Schumacher's uh, group called, at that time, the Intermediate Technology Development Group in, in the UK, in rugby, in, in England. Um, it's now called Practical Action, which is much more succinct and much more descriptive, I think. For, uh, for ordinary people. Another uh, important voice at this time was Buckminster Fuller. Now he had been developing his ideas uh, for the effective use of technology since the 1930s and his work came to renewed prominence in the early 1970s. Fuller believed um, that it was possible to combat famine and poverty through the thoughtful and responsible use of science and technology. And he was one of the earliest proponents of the use of renewable energy sources. And his ideas were very, very influential to the younger generation in the 60s and into the uh, early 70s. So taken together, the work of Papenek and Schumacher and Fuller, amongst a number of others, responded to the environmental and the social reforms of the 60s and pers pers uh, presented a persuasive alternative in the particular area of product design. During these years, fears of nuclear obliteration and environmental destruction and concerns about social inequalities were manifested mainly in the form of protest groups, uh, student demonstrations, and through the formation of small uh, special interest groups. So that was, that was how you might characterize those movements during the 60s and into the early 70s. From the late 1970s on, however, partly due to the aging, I guess, of the people who were protesting in the 60s, many of those issues uh, started to become integrated into the establishment in the form of legislation, agreements, and representation. Now, you can see that change happening because those people 
who were once students protesting so started to get into positions of power, but also because the arguments and the, uh, uh, the points would be, were maturing and starting to make a difference. So, so later on, after the, the, the late 70s, uh, we started to see the, the, many of these things being, being part of the establishment at a much uh, higher level. So in 1983, the Green Party entered the West German Parliament with 27 seats. In 1987, the Montreal Protocol to limit the production of ozone-depleting substances was adopted. In 1989, the Dutch introduced its first, and at that time, the world's most comprehensive national environmental policy. And in 1992, the first UN Conference on Environment and Development, which became known as the Earth Summit, was held in Rio. And during those years, during the 80s, uh, there was further evidence of major environmental concerns and social inequities were beginning to be raised to uh, the public consciousness. There were indications of ozone layer depletion over the poles and the ozone hole and of global warming trends uh, were revealed by scientists. Also in the early 1980s, which this period is covering, uh, reports of the debt crisis faced by many developing countries was followed up by pictures in the press of mass starvation in Africa, uh, especially in Ethiopia. And the inequities, the social injustice and, and social inequities between the rich and the poorest countries were raised to new levels of public awareness through the live aid concerts which were organized by Bob Geldof. And during the mid-1990s, uh, there were numerous reports in the Western press of the use of sweatshop labor uh, by firms in developing countries that were supplying goods to uh, US and European companies for consumption in the West. Environmental degradation and increased awareness of inequities between rich and poor have over the last few years, over the last decade or so, spurred more protests and riots around the world. So we saw the riots in the late, uh, and, and protests in the late 50s and 60s, and we're seeing them again, I know, have seen them again over the last decade, uh, but with a different uh, thrust. The targets of these protests are the major corporations and political leaders who make agreements that, according to the views of the, of the protesters, exacerbate social inequities and environmental harm. Demonstrations and violence were seen at the World Trade Organization meeting in Seattle in 1999, which was one of the first uh, in, in this period, uh, which really uh, broke out in violence and mass demonstrations. And again, at the G8 summit of world leaders in Genoa in Italy in 2001, where there actually deaths occurred during this one. The following year, uh, the G8 was held in Kananaskis in Canada, very close to where I was living, and it was in such an isolated spot uh, that there, w there was no violence at, at this one. Um, and in, uh, in February uh, 2003, we saw the reappearance of the peace march with the biggest international displays of protest since the anti-nuclear and anti-Vietnam war, uh, war uh, marches of the 1960s. And these, of course, were organized to demonstrate against the U.S.-led war in Iraq. And violence was again seen uh, in France at the G8 in 2003. In Cancun in Mexico in 2003, World Trade Organization talks collapsed amid further protests and serious differences between the rich and the poor countries, especially with respect to government subsidies given to farmers in the richer economies, which was alleged, it was alleged, uh, render produce from the developing countries less competitive. In 2005 at the G8 in Scotland, there were further protests and arrests, and also this year, the Live 8 concerts, again organized by Bob Geldof, which this time uh, called for greater social justice for the poorer nations. Then just uh, last year in Russia at the G8, environmental issues in this G8 were off the agenda because of the Middle East, East crisis between Israel and Lebanon and the environment was put on the back burner. But there were other major developments in 2006. Uh, <coughs> the Stern Review, published in the UK at the end of 2006, linked 
uh, in a very persuasive manner, global climate change to potential economic impacts and reduction in GDP by up to 20%. And the UN's World Meteorological Organization announced that greenhouse gases were at a record high, steadily rising and showing no signs of abating. However, at the same time, some were warning against the use of overblown rhetoric and uh, rhetoric of alarm and catastrophe by scientists, campaigners and, and politicians, arguing that this kind of language is often self-serving and unscientific. While recognizing that climate change is real and needs action, it's argued that talking up the imminent dangers and disaster is inaccurate alarmist and feeding a culture of fear, negativity and depression. Also in 2006 we saw the Nobel Peace Prize was awarded to Muhammad Yunus and the Grameen Bank for their work in addressing social development issues at the grassroots level through microcredit. This kind of uh, innovative localized uh, social development enables the world's poorest people to climb out of poverty, and it's, it, uh, it's a key element of social equity and the social justice concerns of sustainability. And of course, social injustice is linked to conflict. So we're seeing now the emergence, just over the last couple of years, of a link in, in things like the Nobel Peace Prize, a link between the sustainable concerns of social justice and environmental protection and peace, world peace and conflict, which are very important developments. Um, and if you're not familiar with the Grameen Bank, this is a microcredit uh, system. And we, I was talking to a class earlier where, where I was talking about a fundamental systemic shift being needed in the way we think about these issues. Now, Muhammad Yunus was uh, educated, I believe, at the London School of Economics in traditional Western economic theory. He went back to Bangladesh and none of what he'd learned seemed to be applying because the, there were very, very poor people living there who were in uh, kind of almost a bonded labor and continuous debt. And so he started lending money in small amounts to these people uh, without, people had no collateral. Uh, so he was lending amounts that in a normal banking system isn't worth the paperwork. And he's lending it without collateral, which if you've got no collateral, you don't get a loan, right? So he really uh, looked at how that was possible. And the, the model that he came up with was trust and uh, peer group pressure, if you like. So if the person he lent the first loan to paid it back within a certain period of time, he would then lend it to someone else in the cooperative group and so on and so on. And that provided the incentive to pay it back. And so there's a very, very innovative banking model at the microcredit level, which is enabling people uh, in the poorest countries to claim out of this uh, debt. Also, this year, in 2006, Al Gore's movie uh, brought the issue of climate change to a broad worldwide audience. Then, bringing it right up to date to 2007, <coughs> at the G8 in Germany this year, after years of foot dragging and disagreements, there was finally some kind of agreement about climate change signed. And now it's full of conditions and caveats, and uh, it's anything but ideal, but it is a sign of acknowledgement and of progress. And also, in 2007, just a couple of days ago, the Nobel Peace Prize was awarded to Al Gore and the... Uh, International Panel on Climate Change for their work uh, on the climate change issue, which has also been linked to potential international conflicts, such as conflict in Darfur, where drought and crop failures meant that people migrated into other areas uh, seeking food and water, and conflict uh, ensued. So in two consecutive years, we've seen the Nobel Peace Prize has been awarded first for social development issues, and second, for environmental issues, two of the main pillars of sustainability. So taken together, 
These diverse events, changes and reforms constitute a very significant shift in attitudes, in understandings and expectations. The modern worldview has to a great extent been replaced by a postmodern worldview where absolute certainties have been replaced by more relativistic and in some cases more tolerant attitudes. Environmental responsibility, social equity and human rights have become established in our legislations and in our thoughts and our actions. The notion of achieving more sustainable ways of living is held up by many as many political leaders and uh, business leaders as something worth striving towards, even if there's, and I would say, there's relatively little understanding of what a sustainability, sustainable society, what might actually look like, and even less of how we might actually get there from our current state of high energy use, resource depletion and consumption. However, over a period of about 40 years, these issues have steadily moved from lone voices and minor special interest groups on the sidelines to the forefront of people's minds, and they are now on an international level at centre stage. They are affecting political agendas, development agendas, and are commanding major resources in terms of scientific and social, social research. In terms of all, what all this means to the designer, there are various ways that these changing understandings have been impacting uh, the field of product design and the manufacturing centers, uh, sectors. A variety of legislations in many countries now control things like the dumping of toxic substances, uh, the amount of air emissions allowed, water pollution, and so on. International voluntary programs lay down best practice guidelines for environmental responsibility. Programs such as the Natural Step, which was coming out of Sweden, uh, have taken up been taken up by a number of major corporations and things like life cycle analysis have been developed to aid companies in designing products to have lower environmental impacts. And there have been a host of other programs and approaches that attempt in a whole bunch of different ways to address sustainable concerns. In Europe, for example, the WE Directive, Waste Electrical and Electronic Equipment Directive, has been introduced to deal with waste electrical and electronic uh, products by making producers more responsible for their products when those products reach the end of their useful life. And when you think that one through, you can see that's going to uh, create a, a, a rethinking of, of how products are designed in the first place so that they can be dealt with more effectively when they reach the end of their useful life. So while there are many developments that run counter to our understandings of sustainable development, there are also many signs of change. Even though labour exploitation in developing countries is still widespread and is still often associated with large Western corporations, there are also areas where a form and positive change is taking place. The production of very large automobiles with high fuel use is still widespread, perhaps especially in North America. The, it went down to the small compact with the oil crisis of the 1970s, which I mentioned earlier, but then slowly and steadily came back. Uh, but there are also now alternatives uh, at the other end of the spectrum, um, such as, uh, as this kind of commuter bike, which uh, BMW produces in Europe, and uh, the Toyota Prius and the, the smart car. And uh, I don't know if, if you've seen, well, you've seen this one, because I saw this one on campus this morning, this little electric car. Um, but uh, I don't know if you've seen this one. Uh, this is the new uh, high wire being developed by General Motors, which is a prototype powered by a fuel cell uh, known as the skateboard concept, uh, because the powertrain uh, is all, uh, and, and mechanics are all located in that skateboard chassis. Uh, onto which it's possible then to basically clip uh, any uh, range of different body shapes. So while there's, there are these positive developments and, uh, and, and uh, technical developments, uh, they're still quite a long way off becoming mainstream. And today, there's still massive reliance on road traffic in general and heavy dependence on goods transportation by road 
uh, rather than the more environmentally uh, benign methods such as uh, rail, for example. But in some countries, uh, to deal with these problems, there are now new initiatives being developed. Uh, Ken Livingstone, the, uh, the Lord Mayor of London, introduced this one a few years ago and subsequently been expanded considerably. Uh, this is the congestion charge in London. So if you want to drive into inner London uh, these days, um, you're on camera wherever you go in London these days, and it, they'll take a shot of your number plate. And if you haven't paid up your congestion charge, you'll get a, a, a fine in the post. Uh, now, that's in addition to uh, paying uh, extortionate parking charges when you get there. Even to drive in there, you have to pay this. Uh, and now, the, so it originally started out as five pounds uh, per car. That's now being in the process of being changed and revisited so that electric cars and uh, hybrids can go in and get free parking. They don't have to pay the congestion charge, and in certain areas they can get free parking. But if you drive an SUV, it's £25. <laughs> so that, so that there's, there's a real incentive there to, uh, to, to consider the type of vehicle. Uh, also in, in the borough of Richmond, in, uh, in just outside London, uh, if, you, if you drive an electric car, uh, you get your parking pass to, to park outside your house um, for free. If you drive an SUV, it's much more expensive than, uh, than if you drive an ordinary car. So it's, it's hitting people in the wallet, which uh, always uh, gets them. Uh, <coughs> uh, and in some areas, we're seeing renewed investment in, in things like city trams uh, uh, and, uh, and city rail systems. This is the sea train in Calgary, which is proudly advertised as being completely wind-powered by these wind farms in, uh, in the south of Alberta. And there are many new uh, examples of products that use recycled uh, materials and clean technologies uh, coming on the market. And recycling programs are, are now commonplace in many, many parts of the world. Uh, and expected, and in some places even mandatory. <coughs> and uh, designers are, oh, I should mention this as well, car sharing programs. There are car sharing programs in all the major cities all over the world these days, where instead of owning a car, you book it in advance, and uh, it's that kind of shared use product, uh, which makes sense in a lot of countries, where that's actually a pain to own a car because there's nowhere to park it and it costs a fortune to do so. But still, on occasional use, uh, you can get one. And designers are exploring uh, new ways of defining products to address environmental and social concerns. Uh, and there are a number of groups around the world uh, which are, uh, and, and small design outfits, which are really kind of challenging our notions of product design the, the Droch Group in, in Holland is one of the, uh, the most well-known, uh, with Rennie Ramakers and, and Kees Becker, who, who brought together the work of, of many uh, designers in, in Holland and further afield, that really challenge what our, what our expectations of products are, how they're made, their aesthetics, how we uh, relate to products, how we get involved in products, how we make our own products, how we interact with products, how we value products, all sorts of different agendas are being addressed. The Boims in New York, uh, uh, husband and wife team, have produced all kinds of innovative work uh, which, which make you look twice about, is that good design, is that bad design, what does that mean for the future of design? Um, there's there's an, many designers working in these areas. They're not particularly commercial design. What they're really doing is looking at design in a more conceptual framework really challenging our expectations of what designs, what design, good design is and, and how it could be. So there's many, there's many positive uh, aspects uh, of, of the, the current uh, design areas which, uh, which are building towards uh, looking at more uh, innovative ways of doing things that address sustainable concerns. But the links that must be formed between uh, localization, and I'll get onto that one, uh, between local scale initiatives and mass production uh, to further environmental responsibilities and social equity and self-reliance have received relatively little attention. We're still generally thinking about product design and uh, mass production 
Uh, and yet mu much of the literature in sustainability is about localization, but there's been relatively little attention given to that in, in, in material product design. And the rates of energy use production, consumption, and waste production in the Western nations continues apace. And there are more and more signs, as we all know, only too well, of climate change. For example, just a week or two ago, it was announced that the, uh, the Northwest Passage is now open for business. That uh, passage across the top of Canada, which joins the Atlantic and the Pacific, uh, throughout history, uh, it's been iced up and not navigable. Um, but now it's uh, completely navigable and free of ice in places. In th th you can actually get a ship through there for the first time due to uh, uh, climate change and the melting of the, uh, of the ice cap. And in the report I heard, which was on the World Service of the BBC, um, it was reported in a rather surprising way because one would expect to hear that, that people were responding with major concern that oh, we've got to do something and this is disastrous. But actually the response was, well, this is going to open up new development opportunities, land development in the north and, uh, and new commercial <coughs> opportunities. And so, you know, we, 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 we still maintain these, I, I would say, rather short-sighted perspectives without realizing that the, that the place is falling apart around our ears. So the vision of a sustainable society, uh, especially with, when the population of, of, the, uh, of the world is now uh, well exceeding 6 billion, is, it seems, much more an ideal than actually a feasible practical possibility. So in this sense, and in a variety of other ways that I've referred to, uh, in this talk, uh, it, it bears sustainability, uh, bears all the hallmarks of a mythic story, a story that tries to come to terms with and provide resolution to, that, to something that is actually beyond our grasp. Now Steiner has explained the criteria for attributing to a body of thought the status of mythology. It must provide, there are, th there are three major things, it must provide uh, an, ideal, an idea of completeness, a total picture of humanity in the world. It must have a recognizable beginning uh, and development and include key founders and texts and so on. And it will develop its own stories, language and scenarios. And I think, uh, I hope, uh, that uh, in what I've just said, in sustainable development, you'll see that we have clear evidence of all three criteria being satisfied. It contains many of the essential elements that are present in the traditional myths and religions, but represented in a contemporary and highly secularized form. Like previous myths, sustainability is about the moral and spiritual underpinnings of being a human being. The three key elements, environment, ethics, and economics, cover our physical environment, our moral sense, and our social well-being. So from what I've outlined, I hope it's clear that while the needs of sustainability may have been sown much earlier, it began in earnest, in earnest during the 1960s and early 70s, starting with the protest movement through social changes such as environmentalism and feminism and through the writings of key people, key authors, such as Carson, Schumacher and, uh, and in product design, uh, Victor Papanek. These ideas became cemented during the 1970s and 80s, and the term sustainable development was popularized by the Brundtland Report in 1987. And as with any good uh, religion or myth, we also have the evangelists and the prophets who proclaim the new vision and who warn of dire consequences if we don't heed their words and change our ways. So the sandwich board apocalyptic who once could be seen on our city streets proclaiming that the end of the world is nigh, has been replaced by often sensationalist newspaper columnists who base their assertions on uh, the authority of science. And there are a plethora of books now available that assert the dangers of continuing on our current course that document environmental disasters, warn of the dangers of health, uh, to health of air, pollu uh, of, of air pollution, and speak out against the policies of major corporations. And some of these arguments are well-founded, while others are more sensationalist, uh, but also more tenuous in their assertions. Nevertheless, there is a body of work that has arisen in recent years to address and begin, begin implementing the ideas contained 
under the sustainable development umbrella and they constitute a rich and very diverse set of ideas and there's also a language of sustainability uh, with terms such as the natural step factor 10 product service systems enabling solutions uh, backcasting and scenario development all these these sort of jargony terms are familiar to those who are working in the field. And so sustainable development does offer an idea of completeness, a total vision. It has a recognizable beginning, identifiable founders, and is spawning a burgeoning collection of narratives, terminologies, and scenarios. And therefore, I think it can be fairly confidently viewed as a contemporary myth. Now, I don't think... The fact that we identify it in that way, uh, I don't think it negates its value or its importance. It simply allows us to see it from a different perspective, and perhaps a more philosophical perspective. While sustainability may not actually be physically achievable, its very presence in our consciousness indicates that there's a discontent uh, and a dis-ease uh, with our current state of things and a need to strive towards something we believe to be better, better for the environment, better for society and better for ourselves. And as Richard Holloway has, has said, uh, he's a theological philosopher in England, he said it this way, throughout history there have been many of these eschatologies of human equality. The fact that they never entirely succeed nor entirely fail, is the main point. They act as a stimulus to the work that is always to be done, of bringing out of the chaos of desire and greed some order of mercy and justice. So I've tried to show in this talk that sustainable development encapsulates and represents particular aspects of traditional teachings. It's a relatively recent phenomenon, and it consists of several broad, interconnected themes that address some of the major pragmatic challenges of our time. But it's often considered a kind of a cure-all for today's environmental and social problems, not merely as an element within a much larger narrative of meaning and significance. But without some greater aspiration and vision of human existence, it's hardly enough to inspire us, let alone sustain us. Ultimately, I think, in my view, sustainable development yields only a partial and ultimately a rather meager view uh, of, uh, of the human condition. Too often, it seems, in the way that it's interpreted anyway, too often, it seems to address uh, some of the more important practical issues of environmental stewardship, social justice, and economic security, but it's often stultifyingly prosaic. It's largely bereft of ideas that nurture and develop the inner person, the inspirational, the imaginative, the transcendental, and the struggle for self-knowledge. They are all aspects of our existence that fuel the artist and the composer and the musician and the poet. And we have a long heritage of mythical, spiritual, philosophical, religious and artistic traditions that can provide us with a foundation on which to base our current endeavours and to address our environmental and social responsibilities. And I think that sustainability and sustainable development must broaden its view. It's, it, in many ways, it is broad, but it, in terms of how people think about it, must broaden its view to embrace this heritage of human culture and meaning. Uh, and these aspects uh, uh, can help make it uh, both a meaningful and a lasting contribution to the way we, uh, we live in the world. So, in an age that tends to give uh, short shrift to religion, and the traditional mythical views of the world, where the very word myth is seen as something which is untrue, uh, it's sobering to realize that I think that we have in effect created our own myth for our own time and appropriately in a language that, that we can accept. But just as now are many are rejecting literal interpretations of traditional sacred texts, we must be prepared 
to do the same for our own. If the question to ask of the traditional myths is not, are they true, which seems to be too often asked these days, are they true, but the question we should be asking is, what do they mean? And if we must ask that of the traditional myths, then we must also ask the same question of our own myth. We must not ask, is sustainability possible to achieve, but rather, what does the creation of this new narrative this presentation is brought to you by Arizona State University's Julianne Wrigley Global Institute of Sustainability for educational and non-commercial use only.